All right. Hey guys, this is Elise. Welcome back to our project CCFIRH, which stands for Catholic and Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. Today, I am with two of my very good friends, Keith and Rachel. They are meeting for the first time through this project within two degrees of connection as my friends. We are each, um, as the panelists, the experts of our own personal narratives, and uh, we are following up from our panelist intro videos. So today we have about one to two questions prepared for each other, and we're going to share the space to converse and learn more about each other and um, hopefully show that talking about race doesn't have to be a scary thing. Um, disclaimer, we're not trying to solve the worldwide problem of racism all in one little video. We're just trying to be encouraging about conversing about this topic. That it doesn't have to be scary. So with that, um, I think I'll pass the invisible mic so to speak, mm -hmm. to Keith, and um, and we'll get we'll get started. Okay, cool. Well, then I will pass the first question on to Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Keith. What's up? Hey. Oh, it's so great to meet you. And you always have a great uh, 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 personality, which I'm hoping you'll have after I ask you this question. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the one question you're tired about? Uh, what's the one question about yourself that you're tired of answering, and why? My one question, um, I, I think the one I've been asked lately, probably within the next two, in the last two months, um, and then I hadn't been asked this question um, before, and it's been a little, a little difficult, has been, what are you? Mm. And for a person who's been um, in the LGBTQIA plus world most of my life, to hear what are you, it's been a little disconcerting, I guess. Um, and I kind of was taken aback the first time I, I was asked that question. And I was like, what do you mean, what am I? And it was like, well, you're not really femme, you're not really a dyke, what are you? And I kind of didn't know how to respond to that question. The first time I heard it, it was kind of like, okay, I, I just kind of said, well, I'm just myself, you know, I don't really dress a specific way. I don't act a specific way. This is just myself. This is who I am. I wear my hair like I like it. I, so, um, but then I've heard it more and more and I didn't realize that that was a thing. So that question has kind of really gotten to me lately. It's, I'm kind of tired of like having to kind of figure out who I'm supposed to be, I guess. Am I supposed to act a certain way or dress a certain way or fit a certain type? So that's the question. But thank you for asking, Keith. <laughs> I, 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 I hate to have been the one to kind of stir up, you know, what, what comes from that. I, I, uh, I, I am thoroughly annoyed. The, the version that, that comes uh, of that question that you get that comes to me is, uh, you know, Keith, you're not like a lot of black people. Oh my! Black person, yeah, yeah. That's been that's been one since decades before Barack Obama was president. We won't get into all of that now because I'll take up all the time on the Zoom. But <laughs> the next time I get asked that question, I'm going to say uh, the kind of person who is going to be plaintiff in the lawsuit against you. <laughs> yeah, I would like so so. I I I'm so hearing you. So I'm I'm like I, I want to look at you and say so. Please tell me what one does that fit into because then you can tell me what I'm supposed to fit into, right? Right. I think I, I definitely identify with that too, because like, what are you is such a common question for Asians. Like, what type of Asian are you? Can sometimes <laughs> also be asked literally, what are you? And people are like, I'm human. <laughs> like, what else do you want to know? <laughs> what else is not obvious, you know? And, um, and it's like such a common question that comes up if, for anyone who's in a marginal space of like not fitting the perfect central mold of whatever is considered or even asserted as central. Like it might not be central at all and yet it's asserted. And like that is immediately pushing someone else who's receiving the question 50 yards away from them with just a question, three words, what are you? So Elise, I'm going to send you to a video that you've got to go check out online, which is okay. literally called the question you asked, what type of Asian are you? 
you are going to <laughs> It's a comedy skit done by, you know, pals of mine over at uh, stuff in, uh, a guy in Los Angeles who speaks Japanese and yeah, 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 he's right. But it's a, it's a hilarious bit. It will strike at your core and will also get to your funny bone. So go check, <laughs> I, go check that out. I can always count on you for, for good humor and laughter. So hey, I, I didn't make it. I just acted like I knew about it, like for the, all the time. And because of that, I seem so much more intelligent and lovely. <laughs> Do you have one for me too? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Oh. You're, I, you're, you're still marginalized in your own section without comedy. Oh, okay. Well, we, can, we can share our, we can share whatever Keith gives me and share it together. And okay. Parallel. Great. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you for asking that question. Um, perhaps someone might hear this and see it and think twice before they ask that question. Um, thinking about what are you? instead thinking maybe um another way to ask a question to somebody is hi my name is yeah what's your name you know what is your name right would right. be a better response to ask somebody yeah or hey i want to get to know you more can you tell me yeah. more about your background or whatever you identify yeah. as or yeah <laughs> or how do you identify would yeah. even be a nicer way to ask a question right yeah 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 so anyway thank you so much for that question keith i appreciate it so i think um you know i think i have a question that kind of builds off of or like continues in the flow of that um also for rachel and um <laughs> i'm wondering um you know because you shared about your gender and sexual like identity and experience and journey in your intro video and um, like one of the ways that you connect with people who are in a different marginalized group and yet also have gone through suffering, there's like something parallel about it. And so um, in, in just the stuff and at, at minimum, this, the parallel is the suffering. And so like, you know, when we think of intersectionality, and all the all the points where we can identify with one another and like create connection, um, even if on the outset it seems like we're so different or whatever. Um, how how did you like cognitively um, recognize and have build language for that that parallel nature? Of okay. Suffering? Well, thank you for asking that question. But if you think for just a second, what we were just dialoguing in just a second ago about the question that Keith asked me about what is the question that I get asked the most that I dislike and the question that I disliked the most ended up having some connection to the question he just that that he had could could take in something that could tie us together in some connection in some way um, there are parallels into something that touches me into something that touches him and what has hurt me what happened to me as a lesbian female what happened to me and that caused me pain um, may not be the same thing that happened to other people but the pain that happened to me I can take and look at and if it's happened to another human being, that pain is pain. My pain may not be the same as your pain, but it's pain. I think that's Does that make sense? For it. That's kind of what I'm going at, is like, so, that's what I'm talking about. So, so I can take my pain and I can say, it doesn't matter whether, um, what the color of a person's skin is you've experienced pain mm -hmm. and i can say i've experienced pain and you've experienced pain so let me walk on that journey with you with that pain because i've been in pain and you've been in pain i can walk on that journey with you in pain and i i can i can be there with you um let me let me walk with that let me walk with that 
I can't have the same, same pain as you, but I can walk with you in that pain. I can walk beside you in that pain. I can help you with that pain because I've been in, in a circumstance before. Um, and it's been real important to me in, in that area to be able to work with other people in that. Um, and being a marginalized person myself, it's very different. It's not the exact same margin marginalization, but having felt pain, I can understand pain. Yeah. And I can, I can, I can take that pain and use those same feelings and understand how other people have felt pain. Not exactly the same. I can't sympathize, but I can empathize. Mm. So that's the best way I can explain it. Thank you so much. That's really beautiful to like have it step, you know, step by step described. Cause I feel like, I mean, obviously like we're friends and I, I understand you in a deep way and you understand me in a deep way. Like these are some things that we already knew about each other, but then for a person who hears it, like you speak it, you know, who, um, like different viewers might connect with you or Keith or myself for whatever reason, you know, like to hear it, how you processing it could be really helpful for someone to like enter the space and figure out how they might enter the space too. Thank you for that. You're welcome. So I want to give you the mic, um, so to speak, if you have a question as well. Um, okay. I want to, um, to ask um, and turn the, the table back to my friend Keith that I've just met. What is one of the questions that you are tired of answering? And how do you, you use humor a lot and it's sarcastic humor, I've noticed. Although I do, I do find it quite endearing. Um, how do you maintain your, how, how do you keep from getting so angry? Those are probably two questions, but that's my questions to you. All right. Which one do you want answered first? Whichever you choose. <laughs> <sighs> okay. All right. So now I got to remember what the first question was. First question was what question am I tired of, of being asked? Ha! Here's one. How can I help? How can I understand you better? And I mean that not 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 in the way of that, but I mean that in the um, in the way uh, that it often gets asked after something dramatic happens, and people feel like I need to be especially not racist. <laughs> you know, when it happens when I, when I don't know. Oh, you see a video of some cop laying on somebody's neck for eight minutes and forty six seconds, and you wonder, what can I do to not be racist? Don't be racist. Why are you asking me? Or, or the thing, or, or the thing, which is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm following up on, on that is that usually the thing that happens in corporate America, which is just also oh annoying, and I still have yet to find the voice to speak out against while it is happening, is that some kind of traumatic event will happen or some world changing event will happen, which inordinately affects a business, right? They had no part in it, but they have to respond. And so, and if it's typically something along racial lines, then what they'll do is that they'll organize, um, for lack of a better term, some kind of racial summit or the sit down or the conversation with black people or the conversation with LGBTQIA. I got all the letters, right? But all of, <laughs> but, but, they'll, but they'll arrange one of those, right? And then, um, you know, and then they'll organize all of the disenfranchised minority in a room in which there are, you know, several white people who are also listening to recount the trauma of disenfranchised minorities to then try to figure out how can we not reenact trauma in disenfranchised minorities? Stop it! <laughs> you know, this is just like, you know, if, if I'm a lion on, on, the, on the Sahara and I go over and, and I see like, okay, I'm hungry and I see a baby zebra and I run over and I kill the baby zebra and a mama zebra is looking at me like, you just killed my baby. Does the lion walk over and go, how can I not recreate this trauma for you? 
You just created the trauma. Stop it. Um, <clears throat> so, so the second question was, how do I not get angry? <laughs> <laughs> I, that question? Oh no no no! It's a it's a it's a fair question, um, and you know the answer is obviously I am calm and cool and collected all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, obviously I get angry. Um, sometimes it comes out rather comedically, other times not so much. Um, a lot of times when the cameras are off and I'm just here alone and you know Casa de Newton, you know it's a it's a painful time. I do my best to not internalize it. And there's so much of all of this happening right now around the world that, you know, sometimes you got to turn off the sources. You got to not answer questions. You got to say, you know, somebody starts to ask you questions about, you know, uh, on top of questions, on top of questions, on top of questions about something I'm sick of answering. I'm like, dude, I, I can't, I can't do this. I had that kind of conversation the other night. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And I almost told him to ask Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but that that would have that would that would have ended a friendship, and I was just like, no, nah, I I can't handle this. I got to stop. You know, I've already I've already lost a pancreas to stress. I've already lost an eye. I really can't afford to lose anymore. So you know, you got to take care of yourself, and that's sometimes it's really hard to do, especially when you want to be helpful. But mm -hmm. that's how I try. That's how I minimize the stuff. So I hope that thoroughly answers your questions. It did. Thank you. It did. And I appreciate you for that. I appreciate that. I really appreciate you and being honest with that. Yeah. It was it, it was the baby zebra, wasn't it? That that got me. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Thank you. Or Lisa That's still awesome. thinking about my rant. No, I'm <laughs> I'm thinking about the baby zebra um, got her too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm thinking about um, my appreciation that like you know we are on camera, right? But like as friends, there's something that's so luxurious about friendship that you can that we can be like a full range of emotion. And in a minority group, a lot of times our emotions get like muted into a very like particular set of things that are acceptable and then a particular set of things that are so unacceptable. And so like, Keith, I feel like um, I'm, I'm feeling like I've always known you to be a very full person, you know, and really in truth, everybody actually is right. And like to like verbalize, like at times you respond in a certain way and other times in a different way, like, and to highlight, like, anger is an okay emotion. Um, like, I want to say that out loud, like verbally, even though it's an obvious thing, I feel like a lot of times the obvious things need to be stated. And so like, I, I want to like respond, um, not only with like the way, I, the fact that I connect with you, but also like affirming that it's okay for a black man to be angry. And, Anger is a normal response, just as much as happiness is a normal response and sadness is a normal response. Emotions are normal parts of being human and you're fully human and you're, you're emotional and you're rational and you're extremely smart and you have a, like, you know, like there's so many things. And so um, I, I feel like such a desire to affirm that. And, um, and also that like, you know, when, and then also to like throw in a little tidbit that often comes up in my practice is that there's a lot of questions about anger because it's not just about like, can people of color be angry? Can black people be allowed to be angry? But it's also like, can children be allowed to be angry? Can parents be allowed to be angry? And like anger has so much shame around it when we discuss it and like anger is okay. Anger indicates that there is a need that is unmet. And anger is also an emotion of movement. Like there's stuff under the anger. And what's more important than the anger is the stuff underneath it. And, um, and so like, I, I, my response is like affirmation for my friend, first and foremost, like for Keith, 
for Rachel's indignation too about that question, what are you? And also for whoever ends up seeing this, anger is okay. You know, like whatever your initial response is, you're human. And then what you do with it later after that initial response is your choice. But like anger is fine. It's okay. And so I, I want to give affirmation. So I feel a real need here first to say a couple of things. I appreciate the effort in terms of what you're saying, um, especially in terms of just humanness and being able to express anger. I think all of that is true. All of that is valid. But I, I, think, I feel like I need to emphasize the point that this is an environment in which I am safe to get angry. Yeah. Most of the environments in which I am, in which I operate all the time, including the apartment in which I am currently sitting, is not a safe space for me to to be angry. Mm. You know, black man raises his voice wherever, many times as a call to the police, as many times I have to monitor their emotional reaction in order for me to stay alive. Mm. Right? I mean, and that's, you know, I'm that's that's just a reality. Anger for me means like if somebody is standing and invading is invading my home and I'm standing or I think there's a threat of a large mob of people coming to invade my home and I'm standing on the lawn with a gun, when the police pull up, I will be seen as the threat versus a couple of weeks ago when a white woman and her husband did it and saw a beast, a peaceful group marching through the road and they stood out there, guns pointed at protesters and they have yet to still be, you know, ar arrested. So I feel like I have to make that point because one of the reasons that you see the anger coming out so much when you do your own practice is because there aren't safe spaces particularly for, I mean, for, for most anybody, quite honestly, but especially right. for minorities to be able to let that out. Letting yeah. it out means you could die. And that's not hyperbole, it's just fact. Right, and I definitely empathize with that because in my testimony to at the State House, I had to stay calm and collected in order to be seen as credible when I gave my testimony. And even when I went to the police office, the police department to write a report, um, I mean, Rachel was there physically with me and she and another friend who's like a second mom I mean, nobody was like verbalizing this, but they were essentially, you guys were essentially using your white privilege to vouch for me because the police wouldn't even give me a form to write my report. They just looked at me in my emotional state as if I was out of my mind. And both Rachel and Don verbalized things to the extent that I'm not out of my mind. <laughs> I'm not out for vengeance. I just need to write a report. And after some time, they finally gave me a form. And that was when I was emotional. So like, due process was not accessible to me in a normal form when I was emotional. And that was like the most vulnerable time of my life. And it's very normal to be emotional when you're vulnerable and in a state of lack of safety. Um, so I, I really identify with you in that too. And it's really curious because like, you know, my dad served in the military and he told me before I was in school, he was like, to survive in this society out here, you can't show emotion. The first person that shows emotion loses. And right. that's probably going to be you. And I like, you know, people, I think that's something that um, because there isn't a lot of intersectional conversation, what I'm finding is that a lot of people have no idea that outside of the black community, these are conversations that are had at home about how we have to present ourselves. And I'm not black, but I am a person of color. And it's a conversation I had when I was like four or five. Um, and so I like, I really, I, I empathize with what you're saying. Um, and I feel like that's another reason I want to encourage people that, hey, like going off of what Rachel was saying that, you know, pain is pain. So even if you're white and you don't understand these conversations because you've never had it, pain is pain, right? And like, there are some points of intersection simply in that there's a lot of shame around parenting. There's a lot of shame about having kids who are angry or behavior issues or whatever. And, um, and like that pain itself can be a connecting point of like, oh, this is a pain. Oh, that's a shame that you might be feeling shame about. 
or like the, the lack of permission to simply feel this thing. And so collectively we can tone down the shame that is placed upon anger or an expression of emotion overall, which can help, you know, overall. Um, and maybe through more relationships and more conversations like these, people can expand realms of safety so that you and I don't have to like, or people like you and I don't have to hide in just friendships to express emotions. Um, so with that, um, I, have a, I have a question for you, Keith. Um, following off of your, your intro video where you talked about your childhood experience, Sure. Um, and I'm going to leave it open-ended so you can share as much or a little, as little as you want, as you're comfortable. Um, how have you carried your personal story um, through these years from that childhood experience? And did you at times feel that you needed to protect your family by not telling the story um, until a little later or like compared to like immediately or did you tell them immediately? Like how did, how did that how did that carry with you? Okay, so we're talking about the story about the story I told about uh, the gun being in my face at age 11. Okay, yeah, so um, so the story about the gun being in my face at age 11, didn't see it because a cop had a light in my face and then when he finally moved it away and I saw it and he's like, did you want me to shoot you? Yeah, um, honestly, you know, it hasn't come back up until I think about other things that have happened in, in life, which, which have surprisingly been worse. Um, and, you know, I don't, um, I consider that kind of a moment in time, even though that could have been a moment that ended my life and I didn't know. Um, but it didn't really, I hadn't really processed the seriousness of it until much worse things and many more discriminatory things had happened to me. Because at that point, that was the first, that was my first real experience with, with discrimination, right? Um, but, you know, later on, as I grew up, you know, as people are asking, what kind of black person are you? Or, you know, or just forcing you to say, hey, you're better than everybody else in the class. We need you to tone it down so that everybody else feels better. You know, these, these kinds of things, or just people saying and lying about you and doing things simply because they know that they can. Um, I've, you know, I've kind of reflected on, I've reflected on it as a moment in time that, you know, that that I now recognize it for what it is, but I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. If I spend too much time thinking about all of the things that have happened in life, um, it's just gonna, I won't be able to move forward. And I am at this point desperately in my life trying to move forward. Um, you know, I mean, it's hard enough actively dating close to my fifties. That's a challenge in and of itself. But, you know, um, but, you know, beyond that, it's like you get to the point where you're like, you know, I'm kind of tired of dealing with everybody else's bullshit. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I got enough things that I got to do in order to get where I want to be. And I got dreams, I have goals, you know, I have things that I want to create for, for TV. And I have, you know, people that I want to have in my life. And I want to be in a certain state with my body so that I can pursue all of those things. And so I just, um, I haven't even really thought about it. The one thing I will say that is that I haven't told my mom the story yet. So if you're watching mom, sorry. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I never really thought to have a sit down with any of them and explain because the moment's gone, there's nothing that I can do about it. But if somebody asks me, I'll let them know. I'll let them know I've reflected. We'll talk about the stuff that's happened, you know, much later um, that is much worse. And, you know, and then just try to continue moving forward because I'll never get justice for all the th wrong things that have been done to me. And as much as I loathe and despise that, I also can say, well, what can I get with what I can do with my life right now? And I can focus on those things and hopefully lead to the kind of, uh, you know, security and peace and, and uh, zone that I'm hoping to land in my life, which will help me forget all of the other crap that happened before. Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah. And there's no right or wrong way to go through it. Um, you know, I, I didn't know that your mom didn't know. So thank you for sharing it, that story here. Uh, oh, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> so we're almost out of time. Um, are there any closing thoughts, any closing questions? Um, if either of you have a question for me, um, 
or for each other before we end our end our little video? Gosh, we didn't ask we didn't ask uh, we didn't ask Elise a question, Rachel. What kind of question should we ask her? What is one question that you hate being asked <laughs> over and over again, Elise? Isn't that a good one there, Keith? I, I, um, I, I, yeah, let's go with that. Let's go with okay. that. Sure. Um, honestly, I've kind of reached a point where I don't hate being asked any questions. <laughs> um, I think the hardest part related to race, since that's, you know, what this project is mostly about, um, I think the hardest points for me were seven, respectively, seven years ago and five years ago. Um, and that, well, five and a half, six years, uh, four years ago. So the first time around that was really hard. I real like, I felt like the way I had to respond to race and the things that were everyday experiences of racism in my life. I was cataloging, I was writing it down. I was like, this is so insane. Like, I don't think I can just deal with this by myself and have this invisible narrative of my experiences where people think that Asians don't experience racism when I go through it literally every single day. And I felt like I had to suss out like, who do I trust? Who's, who's a good friend? Who's loyal? Who's a good neighbor? Like where, what parts of town are safe for me? Like on a constant basis. And I felt like racism was something that I had to be completely in control of myself and whatever I let into my world. And it was a lot of, it was like a full, more than a full-time job. It was 24 seven. And, and that, and even with that, I had this experience where like love didn't seem like it could break, like break the effects of racism in my personal life, in my personal space. And that broke me. Um, but that was just the situation with an individual and a couple individuals. And it was like where we respectively were, we just couldn't continue moving forward. And, um, but at the time I, I like felt like, oh my gosh, if love can't handle racism, what can? This is just a hopeless task. Then around five, four years ago, um, when the stuff that I testified about happened, I realized that no matter what I was controlling in my life, racism that is un, like unresolved or not dealt with in a person exterior to me can still invade and violently like wreck my world to shreds. Um, and so it was like two different pivotal moments that were really, really hard for me with racism. And the way that I dealt with it over the years, I've made a lot of peace and have learned what I can contribute to the issue to help progress things forward and my limitations and, um, and making peace with even my own limitations that I can't solve everything, um, that there's only so much that I can do and to try to do my very best at what I can do. And so um, with that, like, when I, when I see, um, when I see others struggling and in pain, when I see people in fear about racism, I know that there's something I can do. And that's what I focus on. I choose to look at that and whatever people are asking me from their place of fear, from their place of pain, from their place of self-hatred, from their place of identity development, from their place of figuring things out, whatever it is, I see it more as like, this is a reflection of their journey. Cause I've already gone through the hardest parts of my, my journey. Most of my growing up years, people were asking me, adults were asking me when I was under the age of 10, are you more Asian or more American? Are you more this or are you more that? So I've had to go through and research and like been reading history, even without like being put in courses. I was just like, I need to figure out these answers. And so I've done so much heavy lifting for my individual self that I feel like I'm in a position to start giving back. Um, and I remember distinctly when I was really little, growing up in an Irish Italian Catholic neighborhood and my friends were like, well, what are you? And we're this and that. And they're like a bunch of different ethnicities. And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's, I don't know if I'm special at all. You're just one thing like that makes you really special. And I was like, and something like, something like did something in me where I was like, 
but to me, you're my friend. You're very special. Even if you're a mix of things, I don't see you as like a percentage of whatever. Obviously, like mathematically, that's true. But to me, you're like 100% of each of those things. Like that's the people you're from. Your people aren't fractions. Your people are whole, even if you're a mix. And so like, as I go into the future, I'm th like, when I see, and, and in the present moment too, when I see someone who's biracial, someone who's like multi-ethnic, in my mind, I understand that percentage wise, they're like mathematically, you know, fractions. I get it. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, you're like, you're a hundred percent this, 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 like that's the people that you come from. And that all contributes to like the fabric of history and society and your family's cultures that have blended over time. So I could go on for a long time, but I just think humans are so beautiful, so valuable. And um, I just want to contribute to that. And also I have to give my, I have to time myself. So I have to close this project, this video, and thank you both. Thank you everyone who is watching this, whoever, even if it's one person. And I, we just want to encourage you and um, that this doesn't have to be a scary topic. With that, God bless. Thank you. Thank you.